Section 8 of Abe and Morris. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Abe and Morris Being Further Adventures of Potash and Perlmutter by Montague Glass. Chapter 6 A Present for Mr. Geigerman. Part 1. Well, Abe, Morris Perlmutter declared one morning in midwinter. You look like you had a pretty lively session last night. Abe nodded slowly. I want to tell you something, Morris, he said solemnly. I would do anything at all to hold a customer's trade, Morris. I would go on theater with him. I would smear him ten spots when he's got the bid already, and I would go bait on hands which even a rotten player like you couldn't lose, Morris. But before I would go sit through such another evening like last night, Morris, Felix Geigerman should never buy from us again a dollar's worth more goods. That's all I got to say. Why, what's the matter? Morris asked. Well, in the first place, Morris, to show you what a liar that fella Geigerman is, he brings out a fiddle, which he tells us is three hundred years old. Yah, three hundred years old, Morris exclaimed skeptically. A fiddle three hundred years old would be worth the very least a hundred or a hundred and fifty dollars. That's what I told him, Morris, Abe said. I says to him, if you would get a fiddle which is worth that much money, I would quick sell it and buy something which is anyhow useful, like a diamond ring or a scarf pin. But Geigerman only laughs at me, Morris. He says he don't own the fiddle, Morris, but that somebody loaned it to him. Even if he would own it, he wouldn't take two hundred dollars for it. "'My worries if he owns a fiddle or not, Abe,' Morris commented. "'Sure, I know, Morris. But that ain't the point. Afterward, Mozart Rabiner comes in. And if I would be Felix Geigerman, Morris, and a salesman comes into my house and gets fresh with a piano, which the least it stands Geigerman is in a hundred dollars for, Morris, I'd kick him into the streets yet.' "'What's Mozart Rabiner doing there, Abe?' Morris inquired anxiously. Abe preserved a cheerful demeanor, although it was the circumstance of Mozart Rabiner's prominence at Geigerman's musical that had rendered the evening so unbearable. Well, Morris, he explained, you don't suppose that Geigerman buys all his goods from us? Morris elevated his eyebrows gloomily. I don't suppose nothing, Abe, he said, but once you let a shark like Rabiner get in with Geigerman, Klinger and Klein would give them the privilege to cut our price till they run us right out of there. It's an open market, Morris, Abe said. And anyhow, I'm doing all I can to hit that fella's business. You would think so if you would have been there last night, Morris. First a lady in one of them two-piece velvet suits. Afterward I see the jacket, a ringer, for our style, 4220, Morris. She gets up on the floor, Morris, and she hollers bloody murder, Morris. I never heard the like since that Italian a girl which we got working for us in White Street catches a finger in the buttonhole machine. Mozart Rabiner plays for her on the piano, Morris. And when she gets through, the way Rabiner jollies her, you would think she would be buying goods for Marshall Field yet. And after that Geigerman takes the fiddle and him and Mo Rabiner gets together by the piano and for three quarters of an hour, Morris, they work away like they was being paid for it. Mo Rabiner gets paid for it, I bet you, Morris agreed. What a noise them fellas make it, Morris, Abe continued. Honestly, I thought my head was busting. When they get finished, the lady which done the hollering asks them, Who the pieces by, Morris, and who do you think Rabiner says? How should I know who he says? Morris retorted angrily. Richard Strauss, Abe replied. Richard Strauss? Morris asked. You mean that fellow Strauss of Clipman, Strauss, and Blimer, I suppose? It must be the same fellow. Abe said. Seemingly everybody in there knows him, and besides, Morris, that fellow Strauss is another one of the musical fellas, too. Only the other day, Clipman tells me that fellow spends a fortune going on the opera with customers. But I thought Clipman's partner was called Milton Strauss, Morris said. Maybe it was Milton Strauss, Abe continued. Milton or Richard, I couldn't remember. It was one of them up-to-date names, anyhow. And mind you, Morris, that fellow Rabiner has got the nerve to ask me if I didn't like Strauss. What could I say? If that cutthroat Rabiner thinks he's going to get me to knock a competitor in front of Geigerman, he's mistaken. 
sure i like em i says why not in that case mo says we'll play some more of this go as far as you like i says and they kept it up till the elevator boy rings the bell and says a lady on the top floor is sick i don't blame him morris i was pretty sick myself morris nodded sympathetically so then morris abe continued geigerman takes the fiddle again and shows it to us morris and he says on the back is a ruby varnish rubies is pretty high now abe morris said carrot for carrot rubies is a whole lot more expensive as diamonds give this morris abe cried but i seen the back of the fiddle morris and if the varnish on it was made from rubies morris i would eat it the fiddle was an ordinary fiddle like any other fiddle only one thing i see morris on the inside is a little piece from paper you understand and printed on it is a name from some italian or another with some figures on it geigerman said it was stuck in there three hundred years ago when the fiddle was made and you ought to see mo rabbin on morris he looks at the fiddle for pretty nearly half an hour he turns it upside down and he blows into it and he takes his finger and wets it and rubs on it and he smells it and got vice but he don't do with it he's a dangerous fella abe morris commented you don't never stop at nothing to sell goods. Well, I wasn't much behind him, Morris, Abe said. When he smells it, I smell it. He wets his finger, I wet my finger. Everything but that sucker does to that fiddle, I did. He couldn't get nothing on me, Morris. If he would offer to eat the fiddle, you understand, I would got just so good an appetite as he got, Morris. And don't you forget it. I ain't going to let go so easy. Might you couldn't help yourself, maybe, Morris commented you shouldn't worry morris abe concluded i sold felix geigerman since way before the spanish war already i would sooner expect my own brother supposing i got one to turn us down as him despite abe's optimism however the order for spring goods that felix geigerman bestowed on them a month later fell short of their expectations by over five hundred dollars business couldn't be so good with felix this year morris abe commented don't jolly yourself abe morris replied it ain't so much that business is bad with felix as it is better with clinger and klein them two cutthroats ain't paying rabbin or good money for only playing the piano he's got to sell goods too that's all right morris abe said let him go ahead and spiel piano till he's blue in the face Sooner or later, Geigerman would find out what stickers them Klinger and Klein garments is, and then Mo Rabiner couldn't sell him no more of them goods, not if he would be a whole orchestra already. The personality of Aaron Shellac was simply thrown away on the garment trade. His lean, scholarly face, surmounted by a shock of weavy brown hair, would have assured his success as a virtuoso and no one knew this better than his brother, Professor Ladislav Chelak, under whose tuition he had struggled through the intricacies of the first and second positions. If you would only forget you ain't got a pair of shears in your right hand, Aaron, the professor said, and listen to what I'm telling you. In two years' time, you are making more money than all the garment cutters together, and all you got to do is to play just halfway good i suppose you're a millionaire ain't it aaron rejoined and you can play fiddle like a streak the professor heaved a great sigh as he passed his hand over his bald head with your hair aaron he said i could make fifty thousand a year on concert towers alone to say nothing of two recitals up on fifty-seventh street but if a feller only got one arm, Aaron, he would better got a show to be a fiddle virtuoso, as if he would be bald. Thus encouraged, Aaron persevered with his practice for some months, but despite the patient instruction of his brother Louis, the garment cutter's wrist still handicapped him. That's a legato phrase, Louis Shellac cried impatiently one night in mid-February. With one bow you gotta play it. Which phrase are you talking about? Aaron asked. The one that goes to ra ri ra ta ra ri ra He sang the two measures in a clear tenor voice, whereat Lewis snatched the violin from his brother's grasp, and seating himself at the piano, 
he struck the major triad of C natural with force sufficient to wreck the instrument. Sing ah, he commanded. Aaron attacked the high C like a veteran, and Professor Ladislaw Chelak leaped from the piano stool with an inarticulate cry. Immediately thereafter, he secured a stranglehold on his brother and kissed him Budapest fashion on both cheeks. Tomorrow night already you will commence lessons with the best teacher money could buy, he declared. Whose money? Aaron Shellac inquired, as he wiped away the marks of his brother's affection. Yours or mine? Me, I ain't got no money, Lewis admitted. Me neither, Aaron said. He was the sole support of his mother and sisters, for Lewis, as chef de orchestra in a Second Avenue restaurant, constantly anticipated his salary over Stuss or Tarek in the rear of his employer's café. "'How much would it take?' he asked Lewis after a silence of several minutes. Lewis shrugged. "'Who knows?' he replied. Fifty dollars or a hundred, perhaps.' Aaron nodded, and the next day, when he entered Potash and Perlmutter's place of business, he carried with him his violin and bow in a black leather case. Thus it happened— that the strains of Goddard's Berkhues saluted Abe as he stepped from the elevator that morning. And without removing his coat, he made straight for the cutting room. Cush! he bellowed. What are we running here anyhow, shellac? A cloak and suit house or to a theater? Aaron hastily replaced the instrument in its case. I'm only showing it to Nathan, he mumbled by way of an explanation. Might he would like to buy it, maybe? If you would sell fiddles, shellac, Abe said, do it outside business hours. That's all I got to say. He proceeded at once to the showroom, where Morris was peeling off his overcoat. The latter greeted Abe with a sour nod. I'm sick and tired of it, Abe, he declared. Everybody's stealing our business. What do you mean everybody's stealing our business? Abe asked. Last night, I'm sitting in the Harlem Winter Garden with Felix Geigerman, and Leon Samet butts in on us and tells Geigerman he's got a cousin, which he could play shallow, and Geigerman says that he should come around to the house next Tuesday and play it with him and Rabiner. Abe shrugged his shoulders. Might serve us if he does, Morris, he said, because while I don't know nothing about this here game, you understand, a good way to lose a customer is to play cards with him. "'What are you talking nonsense, Abe?' Morris cried. "'Shello ain't cards. A shello's a fiddle which he play it with your knees.' "'For my part, he could play it with his nose, Morris,' Abe declared hotly. "'You mean to tell me, Morris, that a businessman like Geigerman is going to buy a line of goods like Samet Brothers got it just because Leon Samet's cousin plays a fiddle with his knees?' "'Yah, his cousin!' Morris exclaimed. He's as much got a cousin which he plays a shello as I got one. He's going to give some greenhorn a couple of dollars to go with him to Geigerman's house and play the fiddle. And the first thing you know, Abe, Geigerman is buying from him a big bill of goods. And all that time, our orders get smaller and smaller till we lose his trade altogether. Abe laughed mirthlessly and bit the end off his after-breakfast cigar. If I would worry myself the way you do, Morris... Every time a competitor says hello to a customer of ours, he said, as he turned away, I would gone crazy in the head shone long since ago already. Nevertheless, he pondered Leon Samet's move all the morning, and after Morris had gone to lunch, he paced the showroom floor for more than a quarter of an hour, in an effort to formulate some plan on regaining Geigerman's business. His reflections were at length interrupted by a faint scraping from the rear of the store. Once more, Aaron Shellac was entertaining the cutting-room staff with a pianissimo rendition of Goddard's Berkhues. But even as Abe tiptoed across the showroom to crush the performance with an explosive cush, the melody ceased. "'That's a genuine Amante,' Aaron said. "'And you can see for yourself inside. Here is the label.' Abe stopped short. The word Amati brought back to him the scene of Felix Geigerman's musical, and his heart thumped unpleasantly as he listened 
to Aaron's exhibition of salesmanship. Moreover, Aaron continued, here is the scroll, which is ever so much finer as them other fiddles you could buy, for fifty or to sixty dollars. Look at the varnish on the back, Nathan. Shines like rubies, ain't it? What would I do with a fiddle, Aaron? Nathan Schenkman, the shipping clerk, asked. You ain't saying it all, Aaron said, but you got a little boy, Nathan. He ain't a year old yet, Nathan interrupted. Sure, I know, Shellac went on, but now is the time, Nathan. You couldn't begin too early. Look at Kubelik and Chrysler and all them fellas. When they was eaten from a bottle already, the old man gave them a fiddle to play with, and today, where are they? In one constant tower alone, Nathan, them fellas make from fifty to a hundred thousand dollars. He paused, so that Nathan might better apprehend the alluring prospect. And I'll let you have it for a hundred and fifty dollars, Nathan, he concluded. Ten dollars down and two dollars a week till paid. No interest, no nothing. At this juncture, Abe burst into the cutting room. No, shellac, he roared. What are you trying to do, skin a poor fellow like Nathan, which he got a wife and child to support? What do you mean, skin him? Aaron retorted. I ain't no crook, Mr. Potash. That's all right, shellac, Abe went on. I heard every word you're saying. Come inside. I want to talk to you. Aaron's face blanched, and he trembled visibly. But, Mr. Potash, he began. Never mind, Abe bellowed. Take that fiddle and all that mischievous you got there and come in here. Abe led the way to the front of the showroom, followed by the crestfallen shellac, who deposited fiddle and bow and case on a sample table. Say, looky here, shellac, Abe said in kindly tones. What the devil are you trying to sell a schnorrer like that a good fiddle? Why don't you give me a show? The blood surged suddenly to Aaron's face. You? he stammered. Why, Mr. Potash, I never knew you was interested in violins. Sure, why not? Abe replied. Let me have a look at it. First he squinted into the right F-hole, and he grunted in approval as he spied the label, which read as follows. Nicholas Amati Crimonensis. Fetch ye about anno sixteen seventy. Do you know anything about them old violins? Aaron asked anxiously. Abe smiled in a superior way. Not a whole lot, Aaron, he said, but by the time he had finished his examination, Aaron became convinced that his employer was indeed one of the cognoscenti. First, Abe turned the violin upside down and scrutinized the scroll neck belly and back then he blew into the f-holes and wetting his finger he rubbed the varnish for five minutes he pursued the tactics of mozart rabiner and even added one or two fancy touches on his own account until at length he laid down the instrument with a profound sigh always the same thing shellac he said People say it's a genuine, and it ain't. Aaron took up his violin and looked at it through new eyes. Why, it ain't genuine? he asked. I should tell you why it ain't? Abe exclaimed. If you would know what I knew about them things, Tillac, you wouldn't ask me such a question at all. Do you doubt my word? Why should I doubt your word, Mr. Potash? Aaron said. In the inside is the paper, and that's all I know about it. So if you would give me a hundred and fifty dollars, Mr. Potash, you could keep the fiddle, bow, case, and furtick. For some minutes they haggled over the bargain, and at length they closed at a hundred and twenty-five dollars, for which Abe gave Shellac his personal check. And you shouldn't say nothing to Mr. Perlmutter about it, Abe concluded, because I want to make a present of it as a surprise to my partner. When Abe came downtown, the following morning, he wore so marked of an air of pleased mystery that Morris became irritated. "'Let me in on this too, Abe,' he said. "'Let you in on what, Morris?' he asked innocently. "'I don't know what you mean at all.' "'You know very well what I mean,' Morris rejoined. "'You ain't coming around here grinning like a barn door for nothing.' "'I give you right about that, Morris.' Abe said. 
I got in a good schlag at Leon Sam at Mo Rabiner last night, Morris. I bet you. I got from Geigerman a repeat order in them two-piece velvet suits. Seven hundred and fifty dollars. And you know how I done it? Cole reformed him. Morris suggested, ironically. That's all right, Morris, Abe retorted. Go ahead and joke if you want to. Maybe I couldn't play the fiddle with my knees, and maybe I don't know nothing about spieling pianos neither, you understand? But I got a little gumption too, Morris, and don't you forget it. He retired to the cutting room with a set expression on his face, as though to imply that wild horses could not drag from him the secret of Felix Geigerman's renewed patronage. For twenty minutes he remained firm in his resolve not to gratify his partner's curiosity. And then, as Morris continued to whistle cheerfully over the sample rack in the front of the loft, he returned to the showroom. "'Yes, Morris,' he said. "'Some fellas, if they would do what I done with Felix Geigerman, they wouldn't give their partner a minute's peace. For months together, Morris, they would throw it up to him. "'What's the difference, Abe, if a salesman gets orders? How he gets em? Morris rejoined, so long as he ain't padding his expense account. "'What do you mean, padding my expense account?' Abe cried. "'A hundred and twenty-five dollars a fiddle cost me, and that's all I charged up.' "'The fiddle!' Morris exclaimed. "'What fiddle?' "'The fiddle which I gave Geigerman last night,' Abe continued. "'And if you don't believe me, you can ask Shellac.' "'Shellac?' Morris repeated. "'What the devil are you talking about, Abe?' "'Yes, shellac,' Abe went on. "'The cutter. He comes round here yesterday with a fiddle, Morris, which he wants to sell it to Nathan Shankman. So I gave him a hundred and twenty-five dollars for it, and Fertig. "'You gave shellac a hundred and twenty-five dollars?' Morris exploded. "'Are you crazy or to what?' "'It was a genuine Amati,' Abe explained. And so soon as I seen it, Morris, I thought to myself, if them cutthroats could sell Geigerman a big bill of goods, just by playing on fiddles, you understand, what sort of an order could I get out of him, supposing I should just give him a fiddle yet? So that's what I done, Morris. And he did, Morris. And I was right, ain't it? Say, looky here, Abe, Morris began slowly. Let me get this thing correct. You're paying shellac a hundred and twenty-five dollars for a fiddle, which you're giving Geigerman? You got it right, Morris. Abe said. It was a genuine Amati. For a hundred and twenty-five dollars expenses, you're getting an order for seven hundred and fifty dollars, Abe, Morris said relentlessly, and some fellows would throw it up to their partners for months together yet. It was a genuine Amati, Morris, Abe repeated for the third time, and for a genuine Amati, Morris, a hundred and twenty-five dollars is no price at all. Sure, I know, Abe. Morris said bitterly, to you a hundred and twenty-five dollars is nothing at all. What are we made of money, Abe, ain't it? What do you care spending a hundred and twenty-five dollars for a fiddle when for seventy-five dollars on Lenox Avenue, a hundred and sixteenth street, with my own eyes I seen it, I could buy a square piano with a stool and scarf yet as good as new. If you want to shank the fellow something, why didn't you told me? What for a present is a fiddle, Abe, when for half the money you can give him a piano yet? Abe hung his head in embarrassment. But Morris, he said, it was a genuine Amati. For one brief moment, Morris choked with rage. Genuine hell, he roared, and plunged away to the office. For the remainder of the morning, Abe went about his work in crestfallen silence, although Morris, after subjecting Geigerman's orders to a little cost bookkeeping on the back of an envelope, broke once more into a cheerful whistle. "'Well, Abe,' he said at twelve o'clock, "'what is vorbei is vorbei. It ain't no use crying over sour milk, so I'm going out to lunch.' "'What do you mean, sour milk, Morris?' Abe retorted. "'The sour milk is all on your side, Morris, because I'm telling you it was a genuine Amati.' "'All right, Abe,' Morris said as he rang for the elevator. "'You told me that shown twenty times already.' I wouldn't give you two dollars for all them genuine fellas' fiddles and creation, and that's all there is to it. With this ultimatum, he stepped into the elevator, and five minutes afterward he sat at a table in Hammersmith's restaurant, and beguiled with a dill pickle the interval between the giving and filling of his order. At the table next to him, 
sat an animated group of which louis Kleiman was the centre yes siree sir louis declared in defiance of the law of scandal and libel six months i would give the feller at the outside the feller couldn't attend to business if he'd set up till all hours of the night playing fiddle with that low-life rabbiner that ain't all yet neither yesterday he pays for a fiddle three thousand dollars for a fiddle three thousand dollars cried one of the group and the good half of a dill pickle fell from morris's limp grasp that's what i said lewis continued for three thousand dollars yet he's buying a fiddle with my own eyes i seen it in the paper this morning and when a fella puts three thousand dollars into a fiddle you understand he can kiss himself good-bye with his business at this juncture morris beckoned to the waiter say he said hoarsely never mind that roast spring lamb and stuffed tomatoes bring me instead a rye bread tongue sandwich and a cup of coffee after the waiter had gone morris settled back in his chair and listened once more to the conversation at the next table all right then i'm a liar he heard lewis say i tell you i got the paper in my overcoat pocket right now lewis rose from his seat and securing the morning paper from his overcoat he read aloud the following item pays heavily for amadi violin mrs helene caragni widow of the celebrated violinist bella caragni has sold her husband's favorite amati at a price said to be over three thousand dollars the purchaser is felix geigerman who said yesterday that the violin had been in his possession for some time and that there was no doubt of its authenticity it was presented to caragni by the late prince ludovic esterhazy whose collection of cremona violins now preserved by his son is said to be the finest in the world mr geigerman is the well-known harlem dry goods merchant lewis kleinman folded the paper and laid it on the table that's the way it goes boys he said in heightened tones for by this time he had caught sight of morris a new beginner comes to you and give him a little line of credit you understand and pretty soon he's buying more and more goods till he gets to be a big maker like felix geigerman then either of two things happens to you either he begins to think you're too small for him and he turns around and buys goods from some other sucker you understand or he goes to work and throws away his money left and right on automobiles or the fiddles and sooner or later he busts up on you and that's the way it goes you shouldn't worry yourself kleinman morris cried turning around in his chair felix geigerman ain't gonna fail just yet a while me worry kleinman retorted for my part felix geigerman could fail tomorrow yet he don't owe me one cent i never would i ain't looking to sell no goods to fiddlers perlmutter i'm dealing only with merchants furthermore morris went on if felix geigerman hears that you're making a break like this that he's going to fail yet and all sorts of crooks you're calling him kleinman he would sue you in the courts for a hundred thousand dollars yet from a big mouth a feller could get himself into a whole lot of trouble kleinman scrambled hastily to his feet and seized his hat what are you talking nonsense perlmutter he exclaimed i ain't said nothing of the way about geigerman you're the one what's putting the words into my mouth already did you ever hear anything like it i'm saying geigerman is going to fail an idea i never said nothing of the kind all i'm saying is what is right here in the paper black and white and if you don't believe me you can read it for yourself he handed the paper to morris and as the latter commenced to read over the geigerman paragraph kleinman and his friends slunk hurriedly out of the restaurant for nearly half an hour morris pored over the newspaper then he choked down the sandwich and swallowed the coffee which by this time was cold end of section eight